today we are focusing very much on Ukraine, of course, the war there and the transition for the country as it hopefully at some point looks to rebuild. Just so you know, we have Vladimir Klitschko on the stage at 2.30 today. So please put that in your diary and come back and join you. It's going to be the most amazing session to listen to him. And we're going to start today with a very sobering example of how technology is playing a vital role in documenting the, the war crimes and the atrocities that are taking place in Ukraine. Now, it was a great pleasure to listen to Jonathan Doton in Davos in May. I was absolutely spellbound by the work that he's doing. And we're delighted to say that Jonathan is returned to Davos once again to tell us how that incredible technology has evolved and is helping the people of Ukraine. So a round of applause, please, for Jonathan Doton. Come on up, Jonathan. Nice to see you. Great to see you. See you. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you all for joining me. My name is Jonathan Doden, and I'm the founding director of the Starling Lab for Data Integrity, which is based at Stanford and at USC. We are the first academic research center to focus on how decentralized technologies can help advance human rights. And today, I'm really excited to take you through a path that shows you how, in all areas that we work, in law and journalism and history, we are using new technologies to help advance a really critical cause which is to look at how are we going to deal with the collective memory of our civilization. In the past, that would have been with books and oral tradition, but increasingly we're relying on digital technology. And we rely on the internet as the keeper of all of these memories. And yet, on this very stage earlier this week, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the World Wide Web, was one of many voices that explained how the internet has now gone to the point where it has truly failed us. There's something terribly wrong about the way in which we now rely on centralized powers that are motivated by a completely different set of objectives of capital formation to think about the importance of the integrity of such vital information. Are we gonna trust them alone to hold our collective memory? Or is there an alternative? Well, in our case, we look at crypto as a potential solution. And I don't mean crypto as in cryptocurrency, which is what most people think crypto stands for these days, I mean the underlying technology, cryptography. It's a thousands and thousands of year old tradition of mathematics that seeks to do really two simple things. One, authenticate information so that you know what the original digital object can be. And then the second is that it can protect or can encrypt information. These are two vital skills and, and capabilities that people in the human rights field need every single day in order to do their job. And when you think about it in terms of the stack of how the internet is composed, it's not at the top of where, where we focus on things like payments or applications. We work from the bottom up. We look at storage. We look at compute, identity, and governance. These are the things that we need to radically transform with the next generation of the internet so that indeed it can be more resilient, it can be more equitable. So those types of crypto utilities are what we use. And the situation in Ukraine has become a crucible for putting these types of technologies to use. And there, you have a population that has embraced these technologies because ultimately, they don't have another choice. They, in these extreme times, they need new super capabilities in order to do their work safely. So let me explain to you a little bit about how we've deployed it. The name of our project is called Project Dokaz, which in Ukrainian means proof. And what we've done is we've taken a number of different experts from different fields and brought them to think about accountability and using these new tools to help create ways of preserving evidence of war crimes. The work extends across all the different domains of our lab, and they've really come together, and I'm excited to share with you some very important announcements that we've made that have been, indeed, big developments over the last six months. The first, the lab has now been focusing on a particular type of war crime, which is indeed the most difficult to prove, which is attacks on civilian objects like schools. What you see here is School 17. This was attacked in March and then again in June. It sits in Kharkiv. And School 17, unfortunately, is no different than so many other schools across Ukraine. Since the full-scale invasion began in late February, over 2,500 educational facilities have been attacked. Make no mistake, there is no military advantage of attacking a school. It is instead an attack on children. It's an attack on their future. And so with the types of technologies that we have, our task is actually quite difficult because what we need to do is take evidence that's actually quite fragile, 
Let me show you a little bit about it. So if you see here, a lot of the documentation that goes on in Ukraine happens with posts like this on Telegram. The Telegram posts are ephemeral. By nature, they're actually quite vulnerable because Telegram itself is neither secure and it's quite centralized. Imagine, just for a minute, what if the CEO, who in fact is a Russian national exiled in Dubai, what if he just decided to take all this down? What if he decided to change this critical piece of evidence? What we're doing is we're preserving it and we're using the types of techniques that I think most people would be familiar with. We're preserving it in something like a digital evidence bag where you have the ability to put the Telegram post inside of the bag, seal it, put metadata about how it was collected, and then establish a chain of custody so that we can take that tweet, or the Telegram post, and move it from the crime scene of the internet all the way up to the courtroom. And that requires a use of other types of technologies that again, are, are by analogy, they should be very familiar. Putting it in an evidence locker room. And then finally, allowing investigators to go and examine that evidence. Everything that we're doing, all the complex mathematics, they're basically, you can boil them down to things that every single investigator does with physical evidence. It's just with math. So we have been working to establish what we call the Starling framework, which allows us to deploy these very potent technologies to do the timeless investigative techniques uh, that are critical for war crimes adjudication, which can oftentimes take decades. I'm excited to announce this morning that we have done a tremendous amount of work in now taking this type of technology and actually putting it into practice. And we've used the Starling framework now to do a Article 15 submission to the ICC. We've taken an incredible amount of information from open source intelligence and we've explained to the court not only the depths of our understanding about what we believe to be attacks on schools that constitute war crimes, but we've gone a step further. We've explained to the court for the first time, this is how these cryptographic technologies can actually prove that this type of evidence is authentic and that it is protected. The Article 15 submission involved numerous lawyers, and I can cite Scott Martin and Ashley Dordana. They were led by Basil Simone. This is historic work. This is the first time that anyone has actually submitted this type of cryptographic evidence as part of a legal submission. And we believe that this is a critical type of work that's needed to bring the courts into the future in an era in which cyber warfare is now commonplace. To show you a little bit about what we've continued to do in this submission that we made just this week, we went ahead and we deployed investigators on the ground to use new cryptographic technology that allow you to seal the imagery that we take on the ground with new types of tools that allow you to freeze the pixels exactly as the light hits the camera sensor and then establish the time, the date, and the place. And then we take all that information and we put it onto the decentralized web in order to leverage wide-scale decentralized systems so that we can ensure the information persists. Because indeed, with luck, soon these schools will be rebuilt, the memories will be forgotten, and the question will be for the children who were denied an education for the last year, how will they reclaim their rights? Because today, their rights are subsumed under their parents. And in decades from now, how will they be able to get their place in transitional justice? Well, this is the type of technology that will allow them to do that. It's advanced technology that allows you to establish exactly where the information was collected and let that persist for decades. It's an important complement to the open source intelligence movement, which you may have heard of with Bellingcat and others. They're doing the critical work remotely. We're combining that remote work now with work on the ground and explaining how cryptography is a critical part of that process. I'll continue. We're also very pleased to announce that we are expanding our capabilities dramatically. And this morning, we're pleased to announce that we're working with one of the leading international law firms, Ropes and Gray, to provide us additional support with a variety of lawyers from across the practice that are gonna be helping us understand how we can bring the courts into the future so they can use cryptographic technologies for their benefit. We've been very pleased to work with Ropes and Gray and we're excited about creating thought leadership with them that we know is not only gonna be critical for war crimes documentation in Ukraine, but also these are precedents that will spread through the rest of the world. In addition to that, we're announcing this morning that we have made a submission to the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner. 
to explain in depth what we see on the ground in Ukraine and the attacks on children and how it's affecting their right to education and what are the long-term consequences of that. Again, this is history-making stuff in submitting information to a UN authority, which is reporting directly to the Human Rights Council, with using cryptographic tools to provide additional forms of certainty and confidence that this type of information in a very chaotic environment is indeed accurate and is protected. This involves now persistent activity. Yet another announcement this morning. We deployed yesterday for the first time new tools that actually allow us to do advanced consensus and sealing of information actually inside of open source messaging systems like the Signal Messenger. This is brand new technology that no one has ever developed before. Again, we're using the tools that people are, are easy for them to use so that we can rapidly expand the documentation methods and using open source technology like the Signal platform, we're really understanding how this is the type of, of way of um, mechanism for making sure that individuals are able to document with clarity and certainty in this ephemeral and chaotic zone. All right, so these are all the initial announcements that we made just, just this week. I wanna now render for you the problem though and close with a different side of this. And let's think about not just the buildings and the devastation that are affected on children, but let's see it indeed through their own eyes. If children are not at school, well, what are they doing? They're oftentimes in bomb shelters and they're at home. And we were very moved to work with the museum, the MISW Museum, to actually preserve the records of these children's experiences through their drawings. 15,000 drawings are now being uploaded onto the decentralized web, preserved in a secure way so that indeed the children's memories can be preserved for the long haul as well. I think you look at these drawings and I think that it's, it's harrowing because indeed they are suffering in a way that I don't think any of us can truly appreciate. And yet, think of what is the difficulty that they're facing. As school children went back to school in January of this year, they were facing new forms of struggle because the arrival of widespread artificial intelligence is really now a part of everyday life. Teachers across the world are now trying to figure out how they're gonna teach in an era in which with three clicks and a couple of uh, words, you can now have essays that are turned out at a collegiate level or higher by the day. So how are these children gonna deal with a chaotic environment in which now artificial intelligence could potentially wipe out history. And indeed, this strategy of denying people their identity, of identicide, is one that's actively being pursued now. It's estimated that over 200,000 children are being forcibly deployed from Ukraine into Russia. Through a process of repatriation, as it's called, they're having their identities literally wiped out. And this is happening both physically, by the movement of them over there, but also through the systematic confusion and the chaos that's being sowed by misinformation and disinformation campaigns. When I think about the significance of that and the long-term consequences, it's important to go back in history and recognize that, well, indeed, nothing about this is actually new. The erasure of memory is a persistent strategy that has been long used in the Soviet Union and then persisted now into Russia. This year marks the 90-year anniversary of the Holodomor. It was a great famine that was forcibly imposed on the Ukrainian people by Stalin, and it was one that was forgotten, legally speaking, for decades in the Soviet Union. And this here is the same city, Kharkiv, where we took where School 17 is. 90 years ago, it was the scene of devastation again. So as part of our work with the USC Shoah Foundation, which is a founding member of our lab, we are taking the testimonies of the survivors of Holodomor, and that too we are putting on this new secure technology. We're working with the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium and the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center, who've done incredible work in collecting these testimonies. I wanna play for you them one right now very quickly so you can get a sense of really what the table stakes are for the future by listening to the past. <laughs> Чому? Бо вони не хотіли, вони хотіли, щоб я забула, то я ще трохи пам'ятаю. Той малий, напевно, не, то, але, але я пам'ятаю, чого вони, та то їхня ціль була. Вони мусили знати, чиїми діти були. Розумієте? І ото така, то була їхня ціль. 
І, і як Сталін жив, чи по, по Сталіну таке саме, ти не мав права когось розшукувати, бо такого голоду не було, такого і не існувало. І таких пару, що лишилось, їх ніхто не слухав. Advokia is one of millions of people that suffered through the Holodomor crisis. Her words ring so true in this stage in which we are literally experiencing hauntingly some of the very same things about the forcible deportation of children. And the question is, where are we going to store these stories? Are we going to leave them on the internet where they're vulnerable, where they can be manipulated by generative AI to deny their very existence, to create so confusion for generations to come? Or are we going to think about deploying powerful new technologies that are in our hands to think about how we can provide lasting dokas, proof? And what's required is that I think we really reimagine how we're considering cryptography. I know many of you are reading headlines every day, like myself, in which we're all devastated by the type of fraud and the criminal activity that has unfortunately defined this type of technology in the last six months. And yet, it's important to remember this math has lasted for such a long time, and indeed it will continue to last in the future. So what we need is we need to mobilize the good actors, the ones that want to work to ensure that this technology is designed so that it, we can prove with Dokas that it works, that it's ethical, that it's resilient, that it's responsible, and it's inclusive. The power is with us only if we choose to make those good choices. And I'm very proud to say that I've got a team that does exactly that. So thank you for your time and we look forward to working with all of you.